which sins should we obey? Which sins are good and and are evil? I don't know. It's an interesting discussion because we, we have grown up in a, a world in the West where we say primarily, at least more than half of us that have been raised in a Christian home, no matter what the denomination, we still get the Ten Commandments as uh, rules to live by. And I've always been a little confused by those. And perhaps this conversation today will, will enlighten me, will illuminate my understanding. Mr. Schmidt, I am, we've had discussions in the past about what is good and evil and people from different cultures and walks of life around the world have different views on what is what some people may consider good, some consider bad, and vice versa. I think it's the same with people's definition of what sin is. All right, so <clears throat> I'm glad you narrowed our discussion down to the Ten Commandment point. Because if we just go on sin, and that is a huge, wide topic to a huge, wide variety of people, but I think if we can combine this conversation just to maybe the Ten Commandments and why they may be applicable and may not be, and then maybe at the end talk about some things that should be on the commandment list that aren't, just as it's expressed throughout the Bible and how they speak about some things that are sins that didn't make the Ten Commandment list, but are mentioned far more often than things like the thou shalt not kill. Yeah, well, I'm pulling up right now the Ten Commandments because I meant to do it just a second ago. But uh, it, I don't think I'm mistaken in saying that uh, thou shalt not worship any other god before me is the first one. Yes. I think so. I can't remember. Fully. And if it's not the first one, we will edit it out and make ourselves look like we knew the first one. So <laughs> no worries on that front. I just, I just forget. But it's, uh, you know, not to have any other God before me is. It does imply that there are other gods. Yeah, not only does it imply there are other gods, uh, even throughout the Bible, uh, God himself talks about other gods, which was really confusing whenever we were reading through and dissecting in, in great detail the Old Testament. But what really kind of sticks out with me is, like, Okay, you can believe in any particular god, you know, like Hindus and Buddhists, you know, they have multiple gods. You have other religions that have other, you know, multiple gods. Even the Judaic, Judaic Bible has many gods in it. Uh, that was something that was really left out of my Christian upbringing. They didn't, when I was in Catholic school and Baptist uh, elementary school, I was never told about all the other gods in the Old Testament. Like, I, I don't, if I was, I don't remember it. Maybe I was just not paying attention or <laughs> doing something else, but nobody, I don't recall anybody ever talking to me about that. And you went to a, a Christian college. college yes. Did they talk a lot about the other gods? Well, they talk about it in a in a way that makes you think that this God doesn't. Right, so let me back up a little bit. If you read the Bible, this God is very concerned that his people are worshiping other gods. Let's just say Moloch, for one, is a big God that gets brought up a lot. And his own people worship this God, Moloch, and he has to continually kill these people and start wars over the matter. And when you say he, you're talking, you're about, talking about the Christian God, God, the God of the Bible. And there's also a scene in Job where there is a council of gods that Satan is invited to, this council of gods, where God is ahead of it. So we're led to think that either this God is just the God of these people, because there's only one or two times that it mentions in the Bible that God is the God of everything, he creates everything. Most of the time it just says the Israelite God, the God of the Benjamin and Abraham. That's how we're referred to it. So they mention in Christian schools that the people that they're having a war with, the Canaanites for one, they worship this God, Moloch, and this God burns babies for some sacrificial reasons. But we're always taught 
or I, I was always taught in school that those were false gods that these people were worshiping and that the good Christian, the good Jew people are coming over there to help out these people to not sacrifice babies. What they leave out is the bloody and gruesome wars where they're throwing those babies off of the walls of the castle or the city gates. That part's left out. So it's not okay if mullet sacrifices or wants child sacrifices. Not okay. But when the Christian God, the God of the Bible, commands you to go in, like the Battle of Ea, march around the gate seven times, the walls fall, and then anybody that's left over gets put to the sword. And I quote, getting stabbing pregnant women through their stomach to kill the baby inside. The words of the Bible from the Battle of Ea. You can read it yourself. That's how they make it out, and that's the reality of the situation. Okay, so I wasn't thinking about any of those things you just mentioned. I was thinking about, which are all great points, but what is sin? Sin is, when I think of, y'all should, you should not worship any other God before me, I think, well, what is God? Uh, the definition is extraordinarily vague in the uh, Bible, and to me, I think we could relate easier with energy. Like we've talked about so many times when somebody walks into a room, you feel the energy. Uh, we, I think most people, uh, unless you're just really not sensitive to anything, you're practically brain dead, you feel forces of good and evil. You, you can tell when somebody else is, is not a positive person. If they are dragging down either the group or the workplace or your friendship and they they have this negative uh, bent so i like to think about no matter what your particular god may be whether it's um or what a prophet or whatever there, there's many of them depending on where you geographically live it's just energy there, there is good energy and there's bad energy. And we can equate that to the yin and yang. Uh, there's good and there's bad. And I, I think it would, we would be hard pressed to think that that's not true. And to me, I think, well, wh which one is which one's good and which one's bad? Is it the dark one? Is it the light one? I don't know. And which one is causing the negative energy? Is it the dark one or the white one? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Perspective but, of which side of the line you're standing on means a lot in those situations. Man, it means everything. So just just being so uh, vague in, in that particular commandment is explicitly like the reason there are so many denominations just in Christianity. It, but let's be fair. If you make it a very vague law or commandment, it's much easier to try and punish people for not following the command. Well, it, it makes it a lot easier to control a lot of people because you can make it to whatever you want. Yeah, it goes through the times. If this time is you have a problem, make it more about that or less about that. Well, so, so I'm, I'm not sure what sin they even refer to. You should not have any other gods before me. Well, whatever that means, uh, because you're not... It's just really too vague because this is a vague thing for me and I, I'm, I'm lost with it. And I think about, we were talking about a little while ago, uh, adultery is a big one. I shall not uh, commit adultery. And, well, adultery is a strange phenomenon because in this country, almost everybody that you can think of, either they themselves or they know somebody who has had affairs. And then, but that's frowned on here because for a long time we were a one wife, one husband type thing for the most part, except some Indian tribes and uh, until we took them out, mostly. And it's a false construct. It has to be, uh, adultery is an understanding between one person and another person are, are a collective group because there are multiple husbands, uh, multiple wives, and different uh, cultures throughout time. And 
even today, there are multiple wives, and even in uh, parts of Christianity, a lot of people think the Mormons uh, aren't Christian, but uh, they certainly have a pretty large Christian bent. And for the longest time, until the uh, laws were changed, they could have more than one wife, and there's still a sex of them, uh, sex, sex, not sex, of them that have um, more than one wife. So that is, to me, that's not a commandment. That is an agreement between what is acceptable to you, my partner, and what's acceptable to me. And if we have a, uh, an arrangement, that's our agreement. What is? Why is that a sin? That, that seems to me like an egotistical uh, uh, control mechanism to put in place on how to govern uh, the people that you want to control. Well, especially to govern the less and lesser people. Because let's just go to the story of David and Bathsheba. David already has thousands of wives. This other guy's wife is sunbathing on the top of the roof. David sees her, takes her, kills her husband, makes her his wife. Now David, throughout the whole book, is God's favorite. But he's never reprimanded for that action. As a matter of fact, he's praised for these actions. But then it's also as one of the commandments that you shouldn't do. So is it you shouldn't do unless you have enough money and power to do it? And that's only for you people? Because God never says anything to David. Yeah, it's a pretty strange thing. And I was thinking about honoring your father and your mother. Like on the surface, when you first read that, it just seems, oh, well, that's a nice thing. You should honor your father and your mother. Uh, but no, that's not true. There are many parents who do not deserve to be honored. There are abusive parents, both emotionally, physically, sexually abuse their children. Well, it just leaves that totally out. It just says you should honor your father and your mother. All right, so where do you draw the line? Because my dad was, uh, well, I mean, he was a decent dad. He wasn't really good or bad. I don't have anything against him. And... Uh, and as we've gotten older, I've really uh, grown to like him. Uh, but honoring him as a as a child, or honoring him as a father, uh, honoring him as a uh, I would just say I like him. Like who, who are you, you little book, you you scribe, telling me that I need to honor uh, in in so many cases kids that are sexually abused? Oh, you better honor your your, your father who or you need to honor uh, the the former vice president who likes to shower with his daughter you, you, you better honor that uh, I don't think so let's really go back to what is honor and what are you supposed to do to honor them that's never made clear at all like so it's useless information you tell me to it's like saying hey can you go get that book off the shelf in Chinese <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know what you're saying. You didn't give me any guidelines. Just honor. Yeah. And what does that mean? Do you just, when you see him, hey, Dad, hey, Mom, hey, thanks for putting me here. I honor that. And then you walk off and never speak to him again. <laughs> or you talk to him very rarely. It's like, all right, thanks for bringing me in the world. Yeah. Okay. You acknowledged it. Is that it? Like, what's the playbook here? There is no, there's nothing. It doesn't tell you anything. Yeah, it, what, like let's keep it vague again because if you keep it vague, then you can twist it and turn it to how you want society to be. I like to look at the Chinese family structure. They have a very strong family center, much stronger than the United States family unit. And we have this in our book in Christianity of honor our father and mother. But what's in the Chinese community? They don't have that. They have a much better family system than, they, than we do. Yeah, but they also have a, a long, long, long uh, tradition of, of great Chinese philosophers and Chinese practices of, of how the family unit is so close and how they... But go. that's my point, though, is they're brought up on Eastern philosophy and family unit actual real thinking, and the Western philosophy is brought up on this book. So which one led to a better family unit? The theology and philosophy of the Bible, or the theology and philosophy of the Chinese. Well, you know that could that's a good point too, because what would be uh, people would argue that it was the, the 
Christian philosophy that led to the freedom of the United States, and their philosophy led to a communistic uh, dictatorship. Uh, both are, are fantastic uh, discussions and belong in another video. But just honoring your father and mother, there are a lot of parents that are deserving of honor and love and respect. It doesn't say you love and respect. It's you better honor them or that's a sin. Uh, no, the definitions of words change over time, and I'm not exactly sure what that means. And so am I committing a sin because I don't, you know, I love my dad. I don't know if I honor him. Like, that just seems a little much. But I love him. If he called me right now, go, go to his side. So am I committing a sin? Because I don't have this, like, I hold you on a pedestal sort of mentality of honor. But I would argue that if you would just go help him if he called, I mean, that's a form of honor. I mean, if you see somebody broke down on the side of the road and you're in a hurry, you're not going to stop and help them. But if you're kind of in a hurry and your dad calls you or your mom calls you, like, Oh, like you hate it and you're like I guess I'm going to waste my Sunday I'm going over there and helping you but I'm going to do it at least you honored him you didn't have to like it but you did help them out so maybe just that little bit of help is your honor I and mean, you just don't even have to feel bad about it see yeah maybe, maybe you're maybe, doing a better job than you think you are maybe, maybe you're a better maybe. person than you even know it <laughs> <laughs> well I hope so uh, what do you think about the one of uh, uh Thou shalt not covet. I, I like that one, uh, but I also don't like it. I, don't like it. I, I think it's a bad idea to covet it, something that somebody else has. I think it's a form of it's a form of jealousy and envy, and and from my philosophy and the way I think, I'm glad that somebody else has something of value, whether that's a, a really nice house, a quality vehicle, a quality uh, clothes, anything that they have that they work for and that they were able to achieve whatever material comforts that they have as long as they didn't achieve that by harming or hurting anyone else. Uh, if they provided a valuable good or service without causing harm to anyone else I applaud whatever they have I think that is a great thing I enjoy it I enjoy it for them in passing so I don't like I don't like that but then at the same time I, I think of you know, you're struggling as a young man or woman and you're and I do know the definition of both so that is, uh, you're struggling as a young person and you see other people that you want to emulate. And it's not so much coveting as I really would like to have, not necessarily their home, but I would like that my work and my efforts can produce something equal to that level of comfort. And it's, that's a good use of coveting something without saying, oh, well, they have something more than what I have, so I want to destroy them and take them down and, uh, you know, much like people do in governments around the world. Well, well, they have a little bit more and they've been fair and equitable about it, so we better go ahead and destroy them. Well, when speaking about governments, let's talk about the governments at the time that this was written. We were talking about the Bible. Mm -hmm. And they have not gone to the promised land yet. Now, oh, when Moses shows them the promised land that he does not get to go to, the promised land is already inhabited by other people. Now, is it covetous for the people of God to want to steal this land from somebody else because your book told you it was your land? Weren't they not coveting the promised land because it's the promised land and they went and violently took it through a series of wars? 
So doesn't just that one piece of information completely throw out the entire commandment is bullshit? Yeah, probably. <laughs> but I, I think that if, if you just look at it from today's perspective and you read it, I think there are positives and negatives about it, like I just said, and I, and I don't. I don't know. I would never classify coveting something as a sin personally, because just like with all things, whether it's jealousy or envy or coveting, it is. Do you do that in a way that causes somebody else harm? And you can covet something without causing harm to anyone else, including yourself. You can do it in a positive way. Like I want to attain what what they have. I don't I don't covet that other man's wife because I want to go out and you know, hey baby, what's your number? Your husband ain't here this weekend. Yeah, none, none of that. You can look at a beautiful beautiful woman, and whether beautiful physically, mentally, emotionally, just a all around healthy beautiful woman, and go wow. I would really like to have one of those when I become a man, when I become an adult, when I start to uh, go through my life, I would like to have what that guy has. He has a loving, caring, understanding, wise, physically attractive, intelligent woman. I'm glad you brought up relationships because is it unfair, is it a sin to covet a relationship between a father and son? You have a friend, and he's always hanging out with his dad, or he's always hanging out with his mom, and they do things together. And you feel a little bit left out because your dad always works, and he's not there. He's not a bad dad. He's providing for you, but he's gone. But you see Jimmy over there, and man, you really want to be with your dad. Is that a sin for that little boy or girl to want to spend time with their mother or father, but they're too busy working and providing, and they see somebody that is one of their peers that has a good relationship? And they say, oh, I wish I had that. That's being covetous of a relationship. So is that committing a sin? If that little boy dies, is he now going to hell because he really just wanted a relationship with his dad? Yeah, that's a very good point, too. That's why I just write, there's a lot of questions that, you know, we were raised in this society. Where, you know, Don't talk about that. We only discuss that in, in a very shallow, superficial way because we allow our preachers, pastors, uh, who, whomever, when we go to church, or even when we uh, go to church, we still don't really discuss it. We rely on the words and the uh, quote wisdom of someone else to tell us what we think, and without examining it for ourselves. And it is frowned upon uh, to have even these conversations in most religious circles, which I don't understand because if you know, we came from God, the, the source, the infinite energy, the infinite intelligence, whatever you want to call it, we, we are some energy. There is good and bad. So if we can't have a discussion, it means we are stifling what the universe and earth and we're totally crippling ourselves from realizing and trying to discover truth for our ourselves when we are denying i think in creating a sin against the energy the good energies of the of the world and the universe by denying ourselves what they gave us what it gave us which is the power of critical thinking and open and honest discussion without any hidden agenda to be able to communicate with one another and say hey why is that true Hey, I don't fully understand that, so let's discuss it. Let's see if we can pull something down to its essence so we can understand. And that's why I love our conversations, because it's something that I, I just have not been able to find anywhere else. And I'm glad that uh, we have this regular following, so thank you all for joining us, because it, it means a lot to us, for sure, uh, to know that our conversations are more stretch out beyond just ourselves uh, but if they didn't i'd still be pretty happy that we have them <laughs> it's uh yeah whether y'all are here watching or not we're still doing this so <laughs> yeah. i'm glad y'all came along for the ride well i'm able to pull up the uh ten commandments so you know i am 
the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto, you know, he's talking about graven images. I didn't finish it. Uh, graven images, like, why is that even in there? I understand that uh, Moses is, you know, they make some calves and some other stuff. But and, isn't the cross hanging before everybody that kneels in Sunday communion not a graven image? Wearing it around your neck, is that not a graven image? Well, that's a good point. <laughs> Something I wasn't really thinking about. I was thinking of in the terms of uh, you know, Moses running around uh, for forty years, and you know they're, they're running to this whole thing of making they some did cows. create us. Well, Moses through God created a statue made of serpents to cure the illness which God had put on His people by getting bit by serpents. So God and Moses together after the Ten Commandments made a graven image that killed her, kept people from dying from flaming snakes. So God and Moses themselves made a graven image. Yeah, that's a, I like your point too, because a lot of people don't think that they're breaking the Ten Commandment by wearing a cross around their, their neck. That is a graven image. That's a very good point that uh, I have not considered. Especially when you go... Uh, like, uh, I'm thinking about Episcopalians and Catholics uh, for sure. A lot of those homes have crucifixes hanging up. A lot. Even people that are, you know, Baptist, Methodist, most of those not so much. Uh, it's not that common, but you'll still see it in, in all sorts of denominations. A lot of them will have it in their home and not necessarily worship to it, but they'll have. The torture device hanging around in various places because yeah. that's what it is a cross is a torture device used by the romans to execute people not just the special jesus guy but they did it to all manner of rapists and murderers and all other vile beings. yeah and i think that's something that gets lost too in this um in religion of today especially the christianity is that it was a torture device and it was used extreme, extremely unsparingly. It was used a lot, nonstop. And that, that is just a fact. That's what it was. Uh, remember the Sabbath day. Now, I like Sundays because Sunday is our day that we always come together and we have these fantastic conversations about a whole array of topics. It's where friends come over and we gather and try to figure out what it means to be a good person. How do you use your mind? How do you, yeah. how do you just have balance in your life and, and find some truth for yourself? Now, does that mean Sunday or the well, some people say Sabbath is Saturday and some argue it's Sunday. Who cares? It's, this, it's one day that you're supposed to say is, is holy and not work. Um, I think there's some merit to that, but is it a sin if you have to work on Sunday? Uh, that, that's a bad thing. Uh, I mean, I would say yes. Uh, it's not pleasurable, but if something breaks out here on the uh, on the farm, the sanctuary out here, yeah, you know, we got a water leak, or we got an animal dying, or something bad is happening. Well, I'm going to be working on Sunday. So does that mean I'm going to hell forever because, you know, I had I had some stuff I had to take care of? See, that one is a really deep point because there are people within the book that for gathering wood on the Sabbath day, they were put to death by being stoned. Oddly enough, there was a patrol of these enforcers that were out working on the Sabbath. <laughs> so it is illegal to be not working or working depending on your place in this governmental hierarchy thing. I mean, let's be honest. If you go back, Aaron, his boys were put to death because they tried to start a fire on the Sabbath and the fire blew up and killed them. So what exactly is working on the Sabbath? Because creating a fire to keep yourself warm has been considered work. It also says in the book that you can't have any light, no light, no fire. So 
all electronics would be out. So even if you're not working and you're honoring a Sabbath, but if you're listening to Christian music, you are listening to an electronic device, which had to be powered in some way. Most of the time, electricity is used to heat water and the steam creates electricity. So there's a fire going just to create that. So everyone in the modern era would be violating the Sabbath based upon the rules of this book. Yeah, well, I'm going to go ahead and scratch that one off my personal list because uh, to me, uh, Sunday, which I consider to be the Sabbath, I realize some people say Saturday. I, I do think if you look at it on a little bit more uh, philosophical level, just, hey, let's take a day off. Everybody needs a day off once a week, uh, at least once a week. I think uh, the practice of two days off every week is a fantastic practice. It gives you the time to do your personal stuff. It gives you time to commune with your friends and family. It recharges your batteries. Hopefully, you're hanging around people that have enough intelligence. You're enjoying their conversation. Y'all are learning something from each other. You, you're not suppressing each other. You instead are uplifting your thoughts, making each other think about things in a, in a new way that enhance the quality and value of your life. And you can only do that if you have a day off. Uh, you can only do that if you have really two days off because you need a day for your personal stuff and then you need to carve out three or four hours uh, for that. So is it a sin to me? Okay. I don't think so. That's my personal belief. And if I have to do something on a uh, Sunday because something happens, uh, you know, my wife gets a flat tire. Is it work to go help her? Well, the, the old Bible says I, I, I can't do any work. That looks like work to me. <laughs> well, according to the Bible, your wife shouldn't have been out on the road anyway. Yeah, that's right. So that's that's of, right. So you probably shouldn't go help her because that was her fault for getting a flat tire because she was out working. That, that's punishment <laughs> in herself. You should do this when she calls, say, just put it on your voicemail because you can't answer it. Because you answer the phone, you're, honoring a, you're not honoring the Sabbath. So you probably put it on your voicemail. If it's Sunday and you get a flat tire while you're out, that's God's justice. I'll see you on Monday, baby. Hopefully you make it home before it gets dark, honey. <laughs> but I can't I'm, talk to you. I'm glad you got that pillow in the car. You know, you're going to come in handy. Yeah, that's a valuable point there. I'm going to scratch that off my, my personal list. One that I find interesting is thou shalt not murder or thou shalt not kill. I, I find that in this country especially to have such a massive population of Christian churches on every corner, in the middle of every street, everywhere you go in the country. And one of the biggest things that this country has promoted is killing other human beings all over the planet. We, we promote killing people through uh, GMO foods and causing cancer. We promote uh, the death and destruction of countless countries because they didn't go along with our uh, hegemony. They didn't, they didn't go along with how we wanted them to run their country. Uh, it is vast, vast destruction. And somehow we justify that to ourselves because we've been fed this load of crap that uh, not only go USA, but go, uh, go freedom. Go freedom. Go freedom. Uh, we're going to be so free whenever we kill all those bad guys over there. Well, you know, taking away someone's other freedom is the best way of solidifying your freedom. <laughs> well, that's the way they look at it. So I mean, that is how that's exactly how they look at it. Yeah, and go back to the promised land. It's yours as long as you can take it. Yeah, it's yours so long as you can take it. That is that is true, and that is something that has baffled me as a little child growing up. Whenever I started learning about or hearing my dad uh, tell stories when I was a little kid about being 
you know, how they did the draft for Vietnam, and his number, well, he, you know, he was doing something and got married, had me, or, you know, whatever he was trying to do to, to get out of going to Vietnam, and like most everybody was attempting to do, and for good reason, murder. That's, that's just, it's crazy that you would see these people everywhere, these big mega churches, the, the little sweet ladies in the pew raising their hands, oh, we gotta, we got to support our soldiers. We've we got to love those soldiers. They're protecting our freedom. They're killing in the name of Jesus. They're, they're, they're killing for, uh, for us. And then people say, well, if we didn't go to these foreign lands, well, we would be destroyed. And uh, really, does anybody not notice the country's falling apart uh, without us being invaded by any foreign enemy? Let's talk about what is this murder thing? Because our society in the United States was based on this Christian culture and Christian upbringing. But was it murder during the Salem witch hunts and witch trials to press by putting big stones on people to confess that they were witches or burn them at the stake or throw them in the water and kill them? Was that not murder? Because they were supposed to have done this crime, the witchcraft? Was that murder? Was it also murder when we had all the Native Americans running around happy as they could be, which they were here long before us and we gave them blankets as gifts full of smallpox. Is that not murder? I mean, your whole country and society is based on murder. This isn't cowboys and Indians like used to play. There was a good guy cowboy and there were the Indians. It was the United States government versus the Indians. And they had biological weapons like smallpox. And they gave them out freely. Was that not murder? I mean, what do you consider murder? Yeah, that's a very good point, too. Just the, the whole foundation of really, I can't think of one civilization that hasn't been a destructive force of another. And that, that one is at a loss for me because it's all throughout the Old Testament, God Himself glorifies murder, it glorifies it. And it's a really strange thing because I would have never believed that and thought that was a, a foolish notion until I actually studied and read it and then cross-referenced it with uh, many other translations, and it's the same. Well, speaking it, of God himself committing murder, when you hear about Passover and Exodus, you hear that, oh, it's the Spirit of God that does this, and God sends out some entity, and if you don't mark your door, the entity will know who's killing who. But if you read the Bible, the translations say that it was God, not some entity of God. It was God himself going and killing all the firstborn children. Is that not murder? Yeah, so there's a little bit of confusion there with me. I, I think murder is bad. I think killing anything is bad, really. I mean, I don't like roaches, but uh, and it makes me kind of feel bad when I, uh, if I ever see one and step on it. I don't like it, but you, but know, you do it. But I still do it because I know it's nasty, and I know I got a man up in this house. <laughs> I mean, uh, but that is a uh, that's I don't like doing it. I don't like to. You know, we've had a uh, little baby sheep die back there. And I just can't imagine having to go back there and kill a sh one of those sheep to eat it. Like, that's just it's so disturbing to me. Yeah. Now, would I do it if we're hungry? Well, yeah. But I wouldn't like it. So, I mean, I understand. It's not a good practice, I don't think, to say, well, my neighbor down there is, I don't really like him. And I think I want his land. And. I'm pretty sure I can take out him and all of his family so I can have it. That's probably a bad idea. That, that just is probably, that's probably a bad set of energy going through my body if I feel that. And See, there's so many different ways of looking at murder. Like when yeah. you're just over there talking about, say, your neighbor, say just one day your neighbor was outside and he shot and he happened to shoot somebody that you cared about killed that person is that then murder because it was an accident 
So then what do you do if that person does kill somebody you love? Is it then murder for you to kill that person? Because you're getting not really a vengeance on the person, but it's kind of a preemptive self-defense if they intended to kill that person that you were close to because they thought it was you. Is that then murder if you kill somebody that intended to do you harm? They tried to kill you and failed, and they killed somebody that you had well, so that goes to, Is that murder that you killed them? They're trying to take you out. They want to kill you. It's self-defense. But is it self-defense if there's no fight action taken? Because a lot of people would say murder has some kind of premeditation to it. But if you know somebody's trying to kill you and you're going to get rid of them, then you have the premeditation to kill that person. But if you don't kill them, they are going to kill you. And throughout the course of history, that has been commonplace far more often than anything in the Bible would lead you to believe. Those things in those situations happen. So is it murder just to protect yourself, even if they're not giving a direct attack to you? But they have given a direct attack to you in the past. I think of much like the Medici family. They had assassins coming at them all the time. So was it murder for Cosmo to send somebody after his enemy that already killed his brother and other cousins and family members? Is that mur then murder just because he's killing the person that killed his family members and they were out to kill him? Then you run into a whole other set of circumstances is if somebody kills somebody and they get hung by the government, then is that government? Is that murder? Yeah, and if the government, you know, we have the, this death penalty, which for, I, I would have to say the, I'm conflicted on it because there have been times where I think, well, you know, that guy should just, we should just take him out. And then sometimes I just think, man, I don't know. And then you see the justice system itself and all the many times that they have uh, got the wrong person. And so I don't know if the guy did a bad thing or not. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I don't think I can say, I don't know, I don't want to be a part of it. I don't want that karma on me. And sometimes when somebody's caught red-handed, they're just, you know, they're, they're raping little uh, boys and girls and then, you know, cutting them up in pieces. Uh, like, who was that weirdo, uh, Dahmer? Wasn't he doing that? Uh, I don't know. I try not to listen to anybody on that because that's what those people really want is the fame to continue down the line. Yeah, for sure. I don't give them any credence, and I don't think their name should be mentioned anywhere. It should just be some psychopath. Right, so it's other a, people coming at them because they want to be famous too. All right, so, uh, but should they be, they should be killed. I think, well, like, those bad people, it's probably not a bad idea to go ahead and take, take them out. If they're a burden on society for just financially, to take care of them, to house and feed them. I don't know, unless there was some other solution where you could figure out how they could be a benefit while they were still not allowed in the general pop population. I don't know. There might be a solution that I've never considered. But I just automatically think, well, okay, you just uh, were really bad. You really hurt another person really badly or a bunch of kids or... Uh, you know, you've been raping grandma or, so, you know, something bad's happening. You know, there are fates Kill. worse than death. And I think that those people could be converted into useful members of society or at least make those prisoners feed and house themselves. That they have to come up with a garden or, you know, something to produce back to society. I think that's probably the best solution because death is really easy for a lot of those people. Yeah. There can be much worse things. I mean, I would think to being a slave to the people of which you've hurt and contribute solely for their well-being or their family's well-being is a much more just and apt punishment. How do you implement that? You know, these things are really hard to discuss in a society as large as ours. But if you go back to some of the smaller civilizations, city-states, um, Greece, Athens, and Sparta, and says, that happened to be commonplace that if you hurt somebody, then you were a slave to that person's family until you repaid that debt or your death. I think that's a better system, but. Yeah, well, it just goes back down to thou shalt not kill, and we kill all the time, and our, we collectively as a society agree to kill as punishment, and 
but our whole foundation of this societal construct is thou shalt not kill. So it, it seems to me when we just look at uh, some of the foundational structures of this particular country is we're a bunch of hypocrites. If that is what we say we believe in, uh, well, we certainly don't honor or do any of that. I mean, adultery is rampant, killing is rampant. Uh, so every, you know, the gods before me, come on, give me a break. Uh, don't do anything on the Sabbath. It just goes down. Don't be envious or covetous. But it seems like we don't need those rules to be good people. We don't need those sins. And what is left out? You know, like, where, where is it that, hey, you need to be a good dad. You need to be a good mom. Uh, where is it that you should honor your body? This is the one body you have. You better take care of it. These are your, uh, these are your friends and family. And y'all should work together to create positive energies and learning and understanding amongst each other. How about uh, don't let your kids go to public school? That should be a number one sin. <laughs> just, uh, and I'm just, <laughs> I'm being facetious there, but that is a, uh, there, there's so many that are lacking that it just is mind boggling. And instead, you have these ar arcane, weird sort of practices that, doesn't make any sense to me. Whenever we should go, hey, let's learn how to have some humility. Let, let's practice uh, being physically strong because if I'm physically strong and I am well practiced and artful in self-defense and so is everybody else, you're probably not going to have a lot of uh, bullies around. Probably not going to be a lot of need for war. If everybody on the planet just really knew how to fire a weapon effectively and efficiently. If everybody was really good at uh, self-defense. It would probably be the safest place. But if instantly, right now, that could happen. Man, you probably not have any fights. <laughs> because the more you train, the more you fight, the more you realize... You know, I, I might be a tough guy, but somebody can still clock me and I don't see it. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing you said there, because I think during the time that these were written, remember that they had just broken away from Egypt and they were marching to the promised land. And now if God is the Alpha and the Omega, and he knows everything from beginning to end. He knows that he is selling these people into several generations of warfare. So I think that these people would have been well-versed in at least the killing arts. And the people that they had to fight, the Philistines, they were well-versed in the killing arts. So I think you would have to phrase it a little bit differently than just being fluent in the martial arts. I think that's a very civilized society in the way that we're looking at it from today's point of view. Now, one thing that I think is interesting going to the Ten Commandments is the things that the Bible speaks about all the time that is left out of the commandments. The first example of what I'm going to say is pork. It says do not eat pork hundreds of times in the Bible. Not once like thou shalt not kill or honor your father and mother, but hundreds of times. Do not eat pork. And we eat pork all the time in this country. As a matter of fact, they're one of the biggest farm animals in the world. And in the Bible, it clearly states, don't eat them. Why did that not make the commandment for us? Is it because Aaron, which was the high priest, didn't like pork, and he put that in later, and that was really just a <laughs> dietary thing? that uh, He was like, yeah, you know, I don't really like this pork thing. Let's just tell people not to eat it. And let's make that a sin in Leviticus. Let's add that on after. But it sure did pick up a lot of steam throughout the course of the Bible. Yeah, it is surprising how dietary habits are not 
Uh, well, you know, you got the 10, but then it also goes on to the whole list of a bunch after that. But really stressing the dietary points of what it, to be healthy, you know, to be well balanced. Like, I think it's a sin to, whenever you start to practice the art of not being, it's not an art, it's a sloppy art, it's disgusting, to not be balanced. To go, oh man, I ate that big bowl of ice cream last night. I better go out and run. I don't need to eat it next week. I don't need to eat any more ice. Ice cream. To be fair, they didn't have ice cream during the time period, so I think they were <laughs> safe of breaking that commandment. So they were okay. There was no ice cream in there. But you, you get my point, though. It's, it's don't do the, the bad thing that would harm your, your body. Well, Mr. Schmidt, I, I made some notes uh, a little while ago. <laughs> I didn't want to forget them because what's not in there? Like, what do we need? What would I personally consider a sin? And I would say not learning history would be a sin. Not learning to take care of yourself is a sin. Not taking care of the earth is a sin. Like allow, allowing mass pollution, allowing... Okay, I have to say that those are all relatively new issues that they did not have any way to think about those things. They didn't agree, really deal with pollution and they didn't deal with they really didn't deal with those things. Your point is well taken and it's well taken because they have the ability to critically think. So it should say critically think people, critically think. Yeah. And that would allow us as these new human conditions evolve that we would be able to think Hey, you know what? We really like to grow food on this planet. Why are we polluting it? Oh, wait, I really want my kids to have a good, clean, safe environment. Well, to be fair, in the Bible, again, it says very explicitly that monocropping is the way of God. That you should not permaculture. It says each crop in its row. And the priests couldn't even wear clothes of different fabric. So if you're wearing polyester out there, 90%, 80%, that's two different fabrics. That's a sin by the Bible. So they're, they thought that because the Bible tells them to yeah, plead. The Bible tells them to deplete the yeah, earth's natural resources. That's what I forget about. Uh, I totally forgot that God was anti-permaculture. Yeah, see, God, which <laughs> created the planet, and he's the master and knows how to do it. Man. And monocrops are a good thing, which we had a long discussion in one of our videos, which I'll show, have to go back and find. Because I'm not gonna tell you which one it is. You gotta play some rats. Yeah, that is so funny. I just completely forgot that God was anti permaculture because that would, and He's anti His own creation. So that's a well. God should have a list for His own sins. <laughs> well, to be fair, again, if you read the book, there are a lot of times that God repents. He repented to Moses. Yeah, sure does. Uh, well, well, Moses calls it. Moses calls him out. That's probably why Moses didn't get to see the promised land. Well, David called him out, and David got to live his life really fun. Yeah, who knows these things? Well, I just think of the conversation about what is sin, and because we grew up in the United States, uh, we we collectively, I believe, think sin is a construct of the Bible. And all right, so let me just stop you there. And I love saying this with all due respect, because you know I'm about to say screw you now. Is that I think one of the biggest sins in this Bible belt of the United States that we live in, at least in the era that I grew up, before any of those sins were even mentioned, especially as you're growing up, was not to have premarital sex, which takes away from the David and Bathsheba story and several other stories in the Bible. But that is a huge one that's not mentioned in Ten Commandments. But I remember that being pounded down people's throats. And I remember people coming to our fourth grade class because the, I'm, uh, I went to public school. So sorry about that, everybody. I regret it. You know, can't do anything about it. But they came to our class and wanted us to sign these little waivers, these papers, like a contract that we wouldn't have sex until we were married. I remember that being a really big deal. And I've talked to several other people that are my age, younger and older, that that was also a very common concern in the place of which we lived at. And that's never mentioned in the Bible. No, that's not mentioned in the Bible. I've never found it anywhere, and we have dissected it. Now, I think that goes back to a sin. Is, is 
protecting your body, being respectful of your body, being respectful of other people. You, I think it's a bad practice uh, physically because you don't know one of what you're going to catch. And, and first of all, young boys, especially young boys, from the time you're about, I don't know, 14-ish or so to 35 or 40, you know, you got hormones running crazy, and it's a good practice to have some self-control. And it's a good practice to have respect for uh, yourself, whatever you, however you define that. But I think uh, premarital sex is is frowned upon, but nobody ever practices it hardly. You know, you say, "Well, that's a bad idea." Uh, I wish my I wish my children, or I wish I didn't uh, do that, or maybe I wish I did do that. There's there's nothing uniform about that belief system at all. Other than some hypocritical statement of, oh, don't have sex before marriage. But have you ever been to a college campus? Or have you have smart, good people, uh, young kids trying to do the best they can, like the old John Cougar song, you know, just, what do you do? You know, I mean, you have people that have physical needs and wants, and they're in their early 20s. Well, uh, most people got married, really, in, in their mid-20s, too. Now people are waiting longer and longer. So now you have people that are 30, 40, that have never been married. And to you say, oh, well, I frown on you. I, de I deny you into my heart and my space because, you know, you had sex out of uh, wedlock. I mean, that, that's crazy. I mean, that, to me, that's just insanity. Uh, we, we have, as humans... Obviously, we have physical needs to be loved, touched, respected. And do you have to be in a marital relationship to be loved, touched, and respected in a way that is beneficial and not harmful to people in that relationship? No, it's, in, it's insanity. It's another construct to control the masses and deny humanity the right to be human. My question is, what is this gateway of marriage really? Is that is marriage a sin to you? No, no. Like, what is the what is the gateway? Like, why do you need this gateway to have sex with somebody? Oh. What is this gateway? Where did it come from? Why do we need it? Now, in today's time, it's letting the courts and government into your marriage in relation or into your relationship. What was it then? Can you not just say and have a pact with somebody and hey, I really like you and. We have this thing together. Let's explore farther. Do you have to have other people involved in it? And tell other people that this is a thing. Like, what does that really change before this error? Yeah. See, now that that what you just were implying leads to the whole social construct thing, where we get into this whole society, and then we have nation states that. All of a sudden, inside of these artificial borders, we're going to tell these people how to live, and you know, democracy is great, and uh, democracy, or communism is or great. communism, or whatever. Uh, in case y'all didn't realize it, uh, most of y'all, we live in a uh, constitutional republic. We do not live in a democracy. It is a form of democracy, and democracy is one of the worst evils ever known to mankind. It's mob rule minorities are squashed, uh, I would think no one would have to mention that to anybody, but look at our circumstances and where we live and how smart people are. I mean, not that we're any type of genius, because we're certainly not. We're still trying to figure out the meaning of the Ten Commandments. I'm sure y'all already have it figured out. I'm sure you do. If you don't, <laughs> you'll have a much better understanding after the video, and you're welcome. <laughs> Well, you can find us on all of the alternatives, and we next weekend, and next weekend, the third? Yes, next weekend. So we're having a, uh, a fantastic theatrical read-off of the, the Declaration of Independence, and we are going to go into each one of the uh, Bill of Rights, which is going to be a blast, and... <laughs> 
it's just going to be fun. So if you're in the local area, come out, hang out with us, and uh, let's just run through the uh, Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence and see where see where how that's unfolding now in, in these states that we find ourselves living in. That, uh, should all be abolished anyway, and there should all be city states. That's just my opinion. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. Man, have a good day.